Hello friends, welcome to Friday Beyond Spotlights, Hong Kong's new insightful program looking into the lives of our most remarkable high achievers and getting their take on the city's past, present and future. Our guests will give their personal perspectives for a new generation, inspiring Hong Kong for a better society. So sit back and relax and we'll take you beyond the spotlights. Welcome to Friday Beyond Spotlights, where we invite leading minds and game changers with incomparable experience and unique knowledge to come on our light-hearted yet informative show to help business leaders and the wider community gain insights, grasp opportunities, and see behind and beyond spotlights so we can get the full picture, dream bigger, and achieve more together. I am your host for this episode. My name is Nick Chan, lawyer and lawmaker. And Friday Beyond Spotlights is honored and pleased to present to you our guest today, Ms. Teresa Chang Yuwa, GBM, GBS, SC, JP, Hong Kong SAR Secretary for Justice. Thank you for coming on our show today to talk about um, Hong Kong's strength as a uh, legal hub uh, and for deal making and for dispute resolution. Hong Kong is a deal making and dispute resolution hub. Our court system is very well established and the judicial independence is guaranteed. And Hong Kong is uh, one of the leading arbitration centers in the world. Arbitration has one added benefit, and that is the enforceability of the um, arbitral award around the world under New York Convention. Mediation, there is also a convention that deals with that. I think I've heard in other jurisdictions, uh, many jurisdictions, um, there's a question over arbitrability of intellectual property rights. Arbitrability of IP disputes is not an issue. People can resolve their dis IP disputes on arbitration. I've done that many times. So that really strengthens Hong Kong as a great place for innovation and entrepreneurship. Very much so. This year is the 25th year of the establishment of the Hong Kong SAR. And uh, Hong Kong is the only city in our country that still operates as a common law legal jurisdiction. Um, so mainland China, like most countries in the world, are uh, using the civil law legal system. Is the common law still going strong in Hong Kong? Oh, definitely. The one country, two systems will continue and with it, the application of the common law in Hong Kong. Beyond 2047? Beyond 2047. We're still very strong in the common law uh, practice. Uh, the, our cases are quoted um, internationally in other common law jurisdictions, and therefore, in a way, it helps to develop the common law. And um, our common law is also very unique because it's the only bilingual Chinese and English common law system in the world. And of course, it provides a very good system by which um, the international financial and business centers are being established and reinforced in Hong Kong. Uh, we have a very strong independent judiciary. Our legal system has a very clear system by which people can have appeal uh, mechanisms by which they can take their matters to a higher court if they're not satisfied. And uh, of course, um, the legislations itself, the statute itself, are very accessible, a very important element of the rule of law because they are bilingual, which means even if you don't understand English, you can read the Chinese for the general public as well. Uh, it is accessible in the sense of we provide it on e-legislation in Hong Kong, so you can get it on the, on the internet and um, a very up to date. And of course, the way we draft our legislations is a very uh, clear and certain language. And therefore, the elements of rule of law, certainty, clarity, access to justice are all well preserved. Number of lawyers are continuing to grow. Uh, we have a number of a large number, I should say, foreign lawyers in Hong Kong, mainly in the in the uh, solicitors branch of the profession. Hong Kong is a leading center for deal making, dispute resolution, and legal services. Do we have enough lawyers in Hong Kong? In the USA, there's one lawyer to every 240 people in the population, whereas in Hong Kong, there's about one lawyer to every 650 people. Objection, Your Honor. Sustain. <laughs> There's never enough. Actually, Hong Kong is an international hub where East meets West, and we're not serving just the local population. All the top international law firms have offices in Hong Kong, and lawyers and law firms around the world are using Hong Kong as the base to serve the Asia Pacific region. Let me show you some figures. Of 
course, when I talked about access to justice, I have to mention our legal aid system, which is also very fair and uh, very um, uh, broad in terms of ensuring that people are able to take the matters to court. They say there's no monetary limit as to where you would go with the legal aid services. Is that right? There's no maximum budget? Yes, that is absolutely correct. And that, that's amazing. I think, huh? That's a very unique thing, mm. I think. I haven't, um, I haven't really come across other jurisdictions that are so uh, um, insistent on ensuring access to justice. Mm. So I think that's something that really reinforces Hong Kong's position in the, in the rule of law uh, practice. Sometimes we see in some um, media, <laughs> foreign politicians suggesting Hong Kong doesn't have human rights. What do you say to that? It's very important to bear in mind that the basic law actually provides that the provisions that are in our Bill of Rights Ordinance are to be guaranteed. So human rights protection and safeguards are actually written in the basic law, which mm. of course is the constitutional document for Hong Kong. And together with the uh, PRC constitution, it establishes our constitutional order. So human rights is protected there. And our court judgments actually set out, we were talking about um, the common law system, mm. the judgments set out the reason how the courts are to take into account the human rights safeguards when looking at whether, for example, the government is um, uh, exercising um, its rights and duties properly and so on and so forth. That's the same everywhere in the world. Sometimes uh, foreign politicians who pledge allegiance to their own country, of course, understandably, um, they, you know, uh, they intervene with, uh, you know, things that are done in other places, in, in Hong Kong, for example. Are they just being rude and nosy, <laughs> or, or is it actually in breach of inter international laws, I wonder? Well, I, I, I would um, start by looking at some of the very fundamental principles of international law mm. between states. Mm. Uh, we start with all states are equal, and because all states are equal, uh, no one should interfere in the internal affairs of another state, mm. because that's the international law. Um, uh, of the principle of non-intervention, and that really is a matter of respecting the sovereignty of another state. And therefore, it's a very fundamental point. And therefore, when people are doing things such as imposing unilateral coercive measures like sanctions on certain countries or on certain people with the view to making them or forcing them mm. to change their policy, that may well amount to an, uh, uh, an interference and therefore a violation of this very important fundamental principle of international law. Uh, as a common law jurisdiction, um, not all our laws are codified, mm. written, easy to read in some ways. Mm. You have to read the cases. Um, now, you know, some business audience might be surprised to see a lot of common law jurisdictions don't have a ordinance uh, that is written like the contract ordinance to flip open the book and read. Um, are there international conventions, um, you know, contract terms one can borrow from uh, to facilitate international trade as a common business language? Yes, there is. And thank you again for that question, because um, uh, one of the most successful convention that has been promulgated by the UNCITRA, the United, Com United Nations Commission on, on in International Trade Law, is actually the Conventions on the International Sale of Goods, CISG. Um, it was uh, its 40th anniversary last year. Uh, well, 2020, actually, I mm. think. Um, and uh, th there were a number of celebrations. But importantly, it also inspired us to enact legislation to bring CISG to be applicable in Hong Kong. Now, one of the things that CISG does is to uniform and harmonize the laws of various countries, because it was discussed through a number of jurisdictions, in order to come to a uniform set of rules that would be applicable to international sale of goods. And uh, uh, China has been a member since 1988, but Hong Kong hasn't really adopted the CISG. And so last year, the law was passed in Hong Kong for CISG to be applicable in Hong Kong and uh, subject to certain procedures, such as a, deposit, uh, a, a deposit to be made in the United Nations. Uh, we are hoping that um, by 
the third quarter of this year, the CISG may well will be applicable in Hong Kong, and that will uh, truly make all the trading activities a lot more uh, easier mm. and for the lawyers to be able to provide advice on one set of law as opposed to a number of different laws you know, in the various jurisdictions would um, be a lot more efficient and facilitate trade. Has the central Chinese government uh, supported you in improving rule of law in Hong Kong and have they listened to you in uh, allowing you to participate in improving the rule of law in mainland China? Well, I, I think it's not just me that they're supporting. It is the one country, two systems that they're supporting. And in supporting the one country, two systems, they definitely also support Hong Kong's uh, reinforcement and establishment in areas that will help to strengthen our rule of law. So I think um, uh, uh, th that's, that's the way one would look at it. And insofar as uh, my suggestions or my recommendations are concerned, I think they have been very, very um, helpful in helping Hong Kong to reinforce our rule of law um, and, of course, developing our uh, legal uh, services. So I, I think we, we have been very fortunate. It's not me that um, the Chinese government, the central government is helping. It's really ensuring Hong Kong as a whole gets that benefit. Thank you, SJ. We'll be back later.